All right, so for this class, uh, we're going to talk about three organ systems, okay, the digestive, the circulatory, and the respiratory in the same class. And the lesson afterward, we're going to look at the other systems. Um, so um, we're going to first talk about the digestive system, and then second, we're going to talk about the circulatory system, and then the respiratory system. All of these systems are going to be pretty important if you decide to take grade 11 bio because they'll come back so starting with the system that we eat with okay the digestive system in this picture it pretty clearly highlights the components of the digestive system imagine that you're a food particle and you just got swallowed by something well that will be your path Okay, you probably won't make it out alive, but that will be your path, and what's what's left of you will be expelled from the other end. So you will go through the mouth, down the esophagus, into the stomach. Well, you won't go through the liver and the gallbladder. They do participate, and so does the uh, pancreas, in digestion. Okay, but you don't pass through them. You pass into the small intestines, come out of the large intestine, and the rectum and the anus into the toilet. Okay. So the purpose of the digestive system is for you to eat. You break down what you eat. You absorb the nutrients from what you eat, and you expel what you don't need, the wastes. You know, if you are, let's say, a worm, you're just a tube. So therefore, your digestive system, your digestive tract is just a tube. Okay, but you guys are not worms. Okay, you guys are a little bit more complicated than a worm, uh, but you're you're essentially also a tube if you think about it. You have one opening, your mouth, and you have another opening that connects to your mouth through the digestive tract, your anus. Okay, you could theoretically pass something through your mouth out the anus and get it back. I mean, we do that on a daily basis, but I'm talking about you can run like a string through it it will come out the other end it's disgusting i don't recommend it but that is something you can do like a tube okay you're you're a more complicated tube you have limbs and everything so the digestive tract is just simply a tube with different layers of tissues okay you, you have epithelial tissue the skin uh, if it prevents it from hurting itself while it moves. So it reduces friction. You have connective tissues that connect everything together. You have muscle tissues. Your stomach churns. And also uh, you have nerve tissues because your brain needs to control your digestion. So we talked about the four different layers and they're all present. Let's start our journey, uh, this horrifying journey through the digestive system uh, with the mouth, okay? You got swallowed, like Attack on Titan style, you got eaten. Except they, they don't really have a digestive system, but let's say they do. You enter through the mouth. Can we please go slower? Yes. Once you're in the mouth, the first thing you do Again, I don't need to tell you how to eat. The first thing you do when you put food in your mouth is that you chew it. If you don't chew and just swallow, that, that, that's how you choke. So chew, the, uh, the purpose of chewing is to break it down into smaller bits so that it is easier to swallow and easier to digest. So digestion starts in the mouth, okay? Your teeth and your tongue they break it down mechanically. Okay, mechanically means physically shred the food. And then saliva, your spit, will moisten the food. And inside of your saliva, you have things called enzymes. These are chemicals that are designed to break food down. Okay, does that make sense? So your mouth does two things. A physically shred the food into pieces. B, mix it with your spit so that A, it becomes moist and easy to go down, and B, it helps you digest the food. 
Okay, Leah has a question. Yeah. My voice is echoing. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, oh, it's fine for a lot of other people. So I'm guessing it's your your audio. You might want to uh, re, I don't know, refresh. You can just exit and come back. See if that helps. Okay. And uh, yeah, like I said, your mouth creates saliva, which helps with digestion. Okay. And then you will swallow the food. Right? You gulp and it goes down a large tube called the esophagus. Now, there are two tubes that connects your mouth and your nose. You don't want food to go down the wrong tube. All right. We, we have a word for that, choking. If food goes down the other tube that leads to your lungs, yeah, that blocks the airway and you die. Okay. That, that's how you choke to death on food. And that happened to me in public once. Very embarrassing. I'm not going to explain the details because I'm recording this. But yeah, it wasn't pretty. I almost died that day. And everyone saw what I was doing and no one helped me. So yeah, people are not nice. So when you eat, be very careful. There, there is a mechanism that your body has evolved to prevent you from choking. When you swallow something called epiglottis, it kind of closes your lungs so that the food goes into your stomach. But if you are not careful and that wouldn't close properly, you choke to death. Okay, so here's your esophagus. This is the tube that leads to the stomach. It's called the esophagus, not, not the asparagus. Please don't say it wrong. Now, this does not rely on gravity. Okay, you might be thinking it's because I'm standing or sitting upright that gravity pulls the food into the stomach. No, um, you don't need to have gravity in order to swallow. You can swallow upside down. Okay, if you're in space, uh, you're, you're free falling, you can still swallow. What happens is the muscles of your esophagus like squeezing toothpaste, will squeeze the food particles eventually uh, reaching the stomach. So you don't actually need gravity. Your muscles will do it for you. And you cannot control this. You cannot choose not to push it down. After you swallow, it is now automatic. We call this peristalsis, okay, the process of you pushing food down into the stomach. Okay, does that make sense? Involuntary. Now, once the food reaches the stomach, then interesting things happen. Okay, The stomach is the primary organ for digestion. Your mouth chews it, sure, but it doesn't do as good of a job as your stomach would. Inside your stomach, okay, especially how many layers, um, there are cells that produce digestive enzymes and acids. Again, enzymes are chemicals that break food down. Acids, well, they're acids, they hurt. That's why if you throw up, it kind of burns, right? Your esophagus feels hot and tingly because that's the acid eating your esophagus. And if you ever vomit, the taste of it is really sour. It's not a pleasant taste. Again, acids are sour and it burns your tongue as well. You have stomach acid. And yeah, they're supposed to kill any bacteria or other kind of germs that enter your stomach. So they sterilize the food. And also, they also break the food down. Also, your stomach will churn. It, it, it's, it has muscles. It will literally contract and physically grind the food. So this is a process in which food gets further digested. To go to a buffet, all you can eat, all right? The, the reason that buffets exist is because they can make money. That means your body, your brain will tell you, hey man, stop eating, all right? You're full, I don't want this anymore. So if you've had enough food, Eating more actually becomes a burden that is not pleasant anymore. It doesn't matter how delicious the food is. Like, oh, I can't do it. No, please don't force me. You, you know what I mean? If you go to a buffet, you cannot eat all their food despite saying all you can eat because your brain will stop you. 
it will send, well, your stomach will send a signal to your brain once it's full, like stop. Now, this no longer becomes pleasurable, so you're not inclined to do it anymore. So that means you're full stop eating. Okay, so you don't fill up the food up to the esophagus. That doesn't happen. Your stomach can stretch, so it can expand as you add food in. So yeah, you do, you can eat a lot. Okay, so once you pass through, oh, can I go back? Here we go. Uh, once you pass through the stomach, you will go to the next destination. Actually, I'm glad I'm back because look, your stomach has a valve. It's like a gate that connects your intestines. Okay, that gate is a one-way gate. It can move food from your stomach into your intestines, but not backwards, okay? Things don't go back. Okay, uh, okay, sure. Okay, we're good? Can we move on? All right. So once you pass that valve, you're into the small intestines. And the, your small intestines are really, really long. I don't know how tall you are, but your small intestines is many times your height, six meters long. It is kind of cramped into your, your abdomen, and the food will pass through your small intestines, all six meters of them. And it is during this journey, absorption of the nutrient happens. Okay, so your small intestines will suck the nutrient, the good bits of the food, and it will move into the blood, and your blood will carry it all over your body so that all your cells get that food so that they can live and grow. Okay, so that's the importance of the small intestines. Its job is to absorb the nutrients from the food that you eat. If you remove the small intestines, because some people have to remove parts of their small intestines because of cancer, um, they will have a harder time absorbing because they have now a shorter intestine. Now, your small intestine is filled with water. So if you were to actually take this journey, if you were swallowed, you would have to be swimming. And granted that you survived the stomach, which is not likely. If you were ever swallowed alive by something, um, the stomach acid should kill you. If you if you don't suffocate, that the stomach acid, yeah, no, you you die. But if you're not dead, then this part should kill you. You will drown because there's water in here. But let, let's say you can survive that. You have scuba gear. You swim through the small intestines full of water and you don't get absorbed. You enter the large intestine. Okay, we call it the colon. Now, here is where some, some that, that is somewhere that you don't want to be. All right, it, you don't want to be here. You probably want to die at this point. Because in the large intestine, well, it's called the large intestine because it is thicker, it has a bigger diameter, but it's much shorter. Now, what's in the large intestine? Pretty sure you guys already know this. Um, it absorbs the water from the food. So this isn't supposed to be wet. Okay, food coming from the small intestine is wet because you've been swimming. Let's not waste that water. Because humans need to drink water. You don't want to drink water all the time. So let's save some water from food. So that food's water gets absorbed. And what's left of it is feces. Okay, that is a really non-vulgar way of saying poo. Okay. Basically, that's how we turn food into poop. You absorb the nutrients first in the small intestine. Once you're in the large intestine, you absorb the water from it. What's left is this brown substance that is somewhat solid and coagulated. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to describe poop for you. You know what it looks like. And then it is expelled from the anus. Any questions about the digestive system so far? Yes? No? We're good? Okay. 
the texture of your poo can tell you the quality of your digestion. Uh, will we need to learn the enzyme? No, that is grade 11 biology. In grade 10, it's just a simple rundown of what happens. You don't need to know the details. So anyway, it, when you take a dump, around 50% of the population has the tendency to look at it before you flush it. If you have that habit, you can examine the texture of your poop, and then this tells you uh, how your di uh, digestion went. If it's liquidy, then your large intestine didn't do a good enough of a job. You didn't absorb enough water. If you're constipated and you have difficulty uh, passing the stool, then your large intestine is overworking. You've absorbed way too much water, and now it is pretty hard and dense. Right? So usually the healthiest is somewhere in the middle. Anyways, we have words for diarrhea versus constipation, okay? So anyway, now let's just move on from that as, as after lunch. Actually, we're in the process of doing that right now. There are accessory organs around the digestive system. But food, they don't have to pass through them, but they're here to help. Okay, liver, pancreas, and gallbladder they all secrete digestive enzymes. Uh, you don't need to know the details of what those enzymes are. Uh, next year you will, but this year, eh, don't worry about them. The liver produces something called bile, and if you actually taste this, it's disgusting. Um, it is extremely bitter, and this helps in the breakdown of fat. The gallbladder stores the bile, so if you're gonna eat, because some people like to eat organs, I don't know anyone that eats the gallbladder. Um, um, liver is a delicacy. Uh, people eat the heart, people eat intestines. I've never heard of people eat the gallbladder because it's disgusting. Um, it is really bitter because of bile. Now, pancreas is another accessory organ. It produces an enzyme called insulin. Okay, for those familiar with diabetes, you know exactly what that is. Insulin is the enzyme that your body produces to help break down sugar. Okay, after you eat, right? Uh, let's say you had a candy bar. The candy bar passes through your stomach into your intestine. That's where it gets absorbed. So all that sugar is now absorbed into your blood. Insulin will then be produced from the pancreas, and then it is responsible for breaking that sugar down so that it is removed from your blood, okay? Normal people have certain levels of blood sugar and that's considered to be healthy. If you have diabetes, it depends on whether you have type one or type two, this process doesn't work. So the blood sugar stays in your blood and which will then eventually go into your pee. So th th that's very uncomfortable because now you need more water to dissolve and dilute that sugar, so high blood pressure and all that. So diabetes is, well, you either don't produce any insulin at all, that is type 1, or you are producing insulin, it's just that your body is not recognizing that insulin, that is type 2. Okay, so both has something to do with the body not working well with insulin. So that's the purpose of the pancreas, it's a very important organ. Okay, do we have any questions? Okay, then. Shall I move on? That's it. Oh, can I please go slower? Absolutely. Um, I'm just going to stay here for a while uh, while you guys uh, copy this. We good? So in the meantime, any questions about diabetes, insulin, or the digestive system in general? Because this is the last slide that will talk about the digestive system. After this, we're going to talk about the heart. Okay. The next one um, is the circulatory system. Now, the circulatory system actually... Uh, works with all the other organs. 
Hold on, there's a question. Now, there is an opposite of insulin. Yeah, of course. Um, your enzymes are antagonistic. Um, sorry, the hormones in your body, a lot of times they're antagonistic. That means they do opposite things. Okay? Insulin breaks down sugar. Glucagon makes sugar. And they need to be balanced in order to keep your blood sugar level constant. If there's an imbalance, you either have high blood sugar or low blood sugar, both of which are bad. Okay? So a lot of hormones are balanced by their counterparts. And only if one is in excess or one is deficient do we have a problem. So, yeah, that's a very good question. Okay, as I was saying, the circulatory system, your blood, um, it works with all the other systems in your body, which is why like, blood is largely considered as the essence of life in, in ancient times. People knew the importance of blood. Blood represents a life because of how important it is. Now, the circulatory system in the picture, uh, basically, um, it shows that there's a heart in the middle, and then there are um, blood vessels, okay? There are two colors here. The red represents the blood vessels carrying blood with oxygen, whereas the blue blood vessels represent blood that do not carry oxygen, okay? Blood isn't actually blue, okay? A lot of people think that if blood doesn't have oxygen, it's really blue. That is not true. We only use the color blue to contrast with red, um, it actually is a dark red color if you don't have oxygen. But dark red and red are really similar. So if you actually correctly show the colors, the textbooks will be very confusing. So that's why we, we decided to use blue, but they're not really blue. We don't have blue blood. Um, our blood is red. If you cut yourself and blood comes out, well, that is automatically bright red uh, because there's oxygen in the air. So... The circulatory system, its job is to circulate blood around your body so that blood can carry oxygen as well as nutrients to every cell um, in your whole body. Okay, so basically that's the function. Carry oxygen and nutrients and then also carry waste from your cells and eventually exit the body. All right, so how does blood flow? Uh, why am I not switching to the, oh, there we go. Okay, so here is how blood flows. You need to know this. Okay, so study this diagram uh, carefully. Um, the heart is in the middle, okay? In grade 10, you don't have to worry about the different chambers of the heart. That's grade 11. Uh, but in grade 10, you do need to know how blood flows. So blood um, after returning to the heart, because your cells will consume the oxygen, now the blood is now lacking oxygen. It will go back to the heart to refill. So you enter the heart, and that's the blue one on the left. Then the blood from the heart will be pumped into your lungs. Okay, and the blood will enter the lungs where oxygen is coming in. That's the breathing. The blood will then take the oxygen goes back into the heart from the other side. Now you're oxygenated. You're ready to be distributed all over the body. So, And then the heart will give you one giant pump and that blood will, will be dispersed all over the body. Okay, that's why um, if you slash someone's jugular, um, that blood vessel over there, blood will shoot really high like a fountain because of the high blood pressure. Uh, the heart is literally squeezing hard so that the blood can go all over the body. If there's a cut, blood will just spill out like a fun, uh, fountain. Uh, why do we have blue veins? Okay, our veins are not blue, they're greenish. It has to some, has something to do with the pigment of the veins, not the color of the blood. Okay, it's not because the blood is red, uh, blood is blue, that makes our veins look blue. They look blue because of uh, the pigment that they have. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, we're good. Any other questions? Okay, then. All right, so what is blood? Okay, blood is this red thing, but 
If you actually look at blood under a microscope, and if we return to school, I do have a microscope slide that has blood. Uh, you can clearly see the components of the blood. Uh, blood is made up of different things. You have red blood cells. That's why blood is red. And then you have, oh wait, sorry. Uh, what, what do they do? So red blood cells, they carry oxygen. That's it. They have one job and a very important job. They take oxygen, give it to your cells, and then they go back into the lungs and get more oxygen. Okay. Now white blood cells, um, they're less common than red blood cells. That's why your blood is not white. They also have an important job. Um, less important than red blood cells, uh, because if your red blood cells don't work, you die immediately. Whereas if your white blood cells don't work, uh, we call it AIDS. Uh, you die slowly. If you get sick, you, you're, you're dead because you have no defense. So um, these white blood cells, their job is to protect your body against invaders. If you're sick, then your blood and your cells are being attacked by bacteria and viruses. Your own immune system would then create more white blood cells and antibodies to fight the infection. Okay, so this is your body's defense system. So it's very, uh, it's less common than red blood cells. Only 1% of your blood is this. And third, also serves an important function, uh, are platelets. Uh, believe it or not, these are cells. They don't look like they're cells. They look like kidney stones, but they are actually cells. Uh, they're also important because if you cut yourself, you don't bleed to death because your blood will coagulate. Okay, They help blood clot. So that's why if you have a cut on your arm, put a Band-Aid on it, few days later rip it off oh look i'm healed and or there's a scab don't rip that scab off because you might start bleeding again that is clotted blood some people have a condition where uh, they don't have a lot of platelets or they don't well uh, work well they don't clot blood easily so any cut can be lethal to those people they will bleed to death because their body can't heal uh, Again, that's very rare in your blood, but very important. And the last thing, so these are the solutes, the things, the cells in your blood. And then the last thing is the plasma, the liquidy part that contains these cells. Okay, it's a liquid with a whole bunch of other proteins and the components of blood, the cells that just move it along. So blood are made up of cells, and those are living uh, units dissolved in a liquid okay plasma is not red plasma is colorless it has a tint of yellow if you, if you go to the hospital um you need blood transfusion uh, normally um, they give you plasma mixed with blood cells okay so you need them separate and you can separate them because cells can easily be separated from its liquid. Uh, okay, yeah, so yeah, okay, that's unfortunate. That's a, that's not a good condition to have. So if you have low platelet count, then yeah, it will be difficult to clot blood, which is why these people need to be really careful. A cut for them is not the same as a cut for a person with normal platelets. It takes a long time. All right, so you have the heart. Um, the heart is probably one of the most famous organs. If, uh, I don't want to say the most important organ because all your organs do vital things. And your heart is especially important because if your heart stops working, you're dead. If your stomach stops working, you can kind of live for a while, but you, know, you definitely need your heart to be working all the time. So a cardiac arrest is very dangerous. Your heart works 24 seven, okay? Before you're born, it is working and you're inside of your mother. After you're born, it pumps 
all the time. Your heart is actually a muscle, a muscle that never rests. It doesn't get tired because it can't afford to. The moment it stops pumping is probably because you're dead. Now, you, there, are, there are ways to revive the heart by running electric currents through it to stimulate it again. But if that doesn't work, you're dead. So you're pumping the heart all the time because it's like you're pumping water in a cycle that is your body. You need to get the blood to flow. If your blood stops flowing, you're not delivering oxygen. Okay, so that's like your UPS system, the delivery system of your body. You're supposed to have a regular heartbeat. Okay, it pumps at the same interval. Now, that interval can change. It depends on a variety of factors, one of which is physical activity. If you get up and run in circles, or you jump up and down, do some jumping jacks, or I don't know, some push-ups. Any exercise will increase your heart rate because when you exercise, you're <gasps> you're doing that, okay? And your heart is beating faster because you need more oxygen. You need oxygen to generate energy. So the more oxygen you get, the more energy you have to continue the exercise. So that's why during aerobic exercise, your heart will pump faster, you will breathe more quickly so that you will replenish the oxygen quicker so that you can meet the energy demand that is being placed on you right now. There are other factors. If your heart beats faster than everyone else's, that is a sign that you're not as fit and healthy. Okay, athletes, um, especially um, a sports player, like um, let's say LeBron James, he, I'm going to bet that he has a really good heart, okay? His heart probably has a lower frequency than all of you. His heart doesn't need to work as hard. Uh, his heart beats not that often because it's stronger than yours. It, LeBron James can afford to beat his heart more slowly because he's more fit. You can train your heart to be stronger. Now, if, if you lie on the couch all day and you never exercise, any activity will raise your heart rate, okay? And if you're an athlete, you can run in circle, you can do some push-up, jumping jacks. They can continue to do it because they're not that tired. They're not working that hard to compensate because they already have a good body built. So they don't need to work as hard to reach that level. Does that make sense? Okay. Also, your heart, because it is beating all the time, it is moving all the time. So there has to be epithelial tissue, skin tissue inside the heart to reduce friction. Because if you do this all the time, you're going to rupture. Okay, so this is very important to have so that the heart can continue beating without damage. Oh, whoops, sorry. Any questions regarding what the heart is? What's it made of? It's made of muscles. It also has nerve connective and epithelial. It's mostly a giant piece of muscle that works 24-7 to pump blood throughout your body at a certain frequency. And that can change depending on your physical activity and health. Okay, we're good? Okay. Your blood vessels, that means, well, there are two types of vessels. Uh, three types, sorry. There are two big ones, one little one. Uh, that means your arteries and your veins. Okay, so Arteries and veins are pretty different from each other. Arteries are thicker than veins. Wait, I have a question here. Um, if your heart stops working at all, you die. Can't you go on a heart pump if your heart doesn't work? Yeah, no, if your heart doesn't work, then you lack oxygen. You're pretty much dead. Like, there's only a couple of minutes that you can live if your heart stops working. Your brain needs oxygen 24-7, and if your heart stops working, the, even the heart muscle itself will start to die, and 
your brain will start to die. You need to resuscitate that heart. Okay, we don't. You can't live on a heart pump. The, what? You can go on a pump. You mean like hooked on a pump for the rest of your life? I mean, yeah, but that that you, you're still on your way to dying. You see what I mean? You, you can't live on a pump for the rest of your life. Your heart needs to beat by itself. Anyway, so arteries versus, uh, okay, a pacemaker, yeah, a pacemaker helps your heart. It doesn't, without it, you would have difficulties, yes. But with it, it helps your heart beat. What? Well, you can have a transplant, sure. Okay. Anyway, arteries versus veins. Um, arteries are blood vessels that carries blood away from your heart. Okay. So because your heart needs to take blood in and pump it out, there are two systems of blood vessels that do this. If you need to pump it out, you need to be thicker because you need to withstand the high pressure of the heart. When you squeeze, you better not rupture. So that's why you're thicker. And veins needs to push blood back into the heart. And the blood has lower pressure because it's away from the heart. Okay, it's really far from the heart. So that pressure, uh, pressure is lower, so it's thinner. But the veins have valves to prevent your blood from going back. So imagine this. Look at your feet. All right, you all have feet. Look at your feet and think about the blood vessels in your feet. Your heart pumps blood all over the body and gravity will actually help your heart pump blood into your feet so you can keep the cells there alive. Now, you need to come back into the heart to get more oxygen. How are you going to go back? You have to fight gravity. Okay, because gravity is trying to pull you down but in order to go back, you have to have these valves inside the vein so that blood can only go in one direction. You cannot go back. Otherwise, blood is not going to go back into your heart. Okay, so that's why you, ha you have valves inside of veins, but not arteries. So you need to know the difference between arteries and vein. Arteries pump blood away from the heart. The letter A are for arteries here, and away, that's how I remember it. And veins pump blood back to the heart, but I, I think of it as back to the heart. Arteries away from the heart, veins back to the heart. Okay, And then you have capillaries. Uh, the capillaries are the smaller blood vessels in between arteries and veins. So capillaries are really, really small. Some capillaries are so small that they only allow one cell to go through at a time. So when your arteries become smaller, it needs to get to all of your cells. Okay, and your arteries are quite thick. So it can't penetrate through everywhere in your body, but they do need to become smaller. So capillaries are in between arteries and veins, and they're much thicker. So it is through the capillaries all of these interactions occur, okay? Gas exchange. You, you get oxygen, you take carbon dioxide, you get nutrients into your cells through these really tiny, thin capillaries. All right, any questions? Okay, so capillaries are pretty much everywhere. Okay, first of all, um, here's a picture. It's so narrow that the blood cells have to line up in a single line to pass through. And they are everywhere in your body. Okay, they need to go through all of your cells, otherwise you're not getting oxygen. So if you look at your hand, you can clearly see some veins in your hand. But if you were to cut your hand and careful not to cut a vein, you still bleed. You cut anywhere in your body and you bleed because there's capillaries 
everywhere in your body. So that's what's bleeding. You don't sever an artery. Okay, that is way more serious than just a cut. So inside of your heart, you also have arteries. We call those coronary artery. Uh, coronary, uh, corona means crown, and heart also refers to uh, corona. Um, that's the crown of your body. The coronary arteries are the arteries of your heart. Your blood uh, also needs to feed your heart. Oh, can I go back? Okay. We're good? All righty. So anyway, as I was saying, <laughs> and I'm just going to show you all of these. Um, your heart is the muscle, and muscles need blood. Okay, Your heart also needs a constant supply of blood. But if your artery is blocked, which can happen if um, you have high cholesterol, which will literally accumulate in your heart and stop blood from flowing. First of all, you can have excuse me, high blood pressure. If you ac accumulate plaque, you now have a smaller volume to let blood through, which means higher pressure. Okay, But if it's completely blocked, then blood won't go there, and the cells will quickly start to die because of a lack of oxygen. Okay, so that's why a blocked artery is extremely dangerous. And you can get a blocked artery by having a high-fat diet, or you, you can be more genetically inclined for that. Smoking also can do this because smoking uh, hardens your arteries and the lack of exercise because exercise increases your metabolism. So all of these can together contribute to high blood pressure, meaning that plaque build up. So that's why you shouldn't eat a lot of cholesterol. Your liver will make the cholesterol that you need. You don't need to eat it. But a lot of food, they do have cholesterol, like egg yolk. Now, egg white is really healthy, but egg yolk is not. Egg yolk is just uh, a lot of cholesterol. Avoid eating that if you can. Now, if you have a coronary art artery disease, um, your heart might look something like that. It is covered in plaque okay so you might feel uh, tired or dizzy because you're not getting enough oxygen and then there could be pain in the chest and arms that is a red flag okay well, a lot of comments here don't you need a bypass yes okay every person on my dad's side yeah, if you get a, a bypass surgery, um, that's basically what the picture is saying right there. That means your artery in the heart is blocked. If you don't do anything about it, downstream of the blockage, you're not going to get any blood. Those cells will die. And if your heart's muscle cells die, guess what? You die. So to correct that, you can get a bypass surgery. You can take a tube. Okay, you can graft it onto your heart so that it directly connects the blocked part with your aorta. That is the biggest artery in the heart. So that you have an alternative path. This way is blocked. Well, I'm going to go the other way. So that you can still get blood flow into that part of the heart. Okay, so you're going to need surgery. My grandfather had that surgery. Uh, he had heart issues. So, yeah... That is a very uh, kind of dangerous procedure, but very necessary. Okay, any questions? Okay. Now, I'm sure that you have been, uh, you, you've seen something like this either on TV or heard about it in the news or something, uh, or in an anime. You write down somebody's name and this happens. A heart attack. What is a heart attack? Well, basically, um, a heart attack is when your artery, the coronary arteries on the heart, blocks completely so that blood will not 
reach certain parts of your heart and those cells start to die and this hurts okay there are certain symptoms of a heart attack uh like chest pain pressure um if you have difficulty breathing nausea body pain around the chest area sweating and dizziness all of these are symptoms of a heart attack okay what do you do when someone has a heart attack does anyone know this can save lives people does anyone know what to do uh cpr and call 911 you don't really need cpr if you're not passed out cpr is for to help them breathe but they're not having difficulty breathing yes um give them aspirin okay and then call 911 don't don't take any risks because the earlier you go to the hospital hospital um uh, the higher the probability of saving that person okay and fewer cells would die so really you're you're in a race it does matter when you get to the hospital the the earlier you get treated the better so if someone that you might even suspect have a heart attack dial 911 immediately and get medical help okay don't take selfies don't post on instagram having a heart attack lol hashtag only live once don't do that you don't have time for that okay and uh, ecg electrocardiogram will if you're hooked up to this a heart attack will be something a little bit different and doctors can then confirm that yep you're having a heart attack any questions regarding what to do and how do you look for a heart attack if you ever have one call 911 don't take your chances don't think oh no i'm gonna i'm gonna tough this one out no okay that's it about the heart um the last thing that we're gonna talk about today is the respiratory system okay the respiratory system is closely related to the circulatory system your lungs and heart work together to keep you alive the respiratory uh, respiratory system is a lot smaller it's just around your lungs and your nose and your mouth but if you look at the picture uh, that's basically it air goes in your nose and your mouth into the tube that connects into your lung okay, that tube is called the trachea inside the trachea it splits into two because you have two lungs it, it splits into bronchus and then it, it looks like a grape if you just look at your the structure of the lung it looks like you have some grapes with little bubbles on the end those are the fruits those are the tinier components of your lung and those are basically the units of the lung those are what helps you uh, do gas exchange you breathe using those structures if they're damaged then you would have a harder time breathing okay so the lungs has one job to breathe so air enters through your nose or your mouth now there is a difference let me there is a difference between breathing with your nose or your mouth okay one is better than the other we should primarily breathe with our nose um, anyone know why uh, what's the difference between breathing with your nose and your mouth breathing through your nose the air is filtered by your nose hairs. yes um smell doesn't really have anything to do with it uh but your mouth is not really designed for breathing you can breathe with it because you know it connects to the same place but your nose has hair in them and also it, you have mucus inside of your nose they can filter dust particles in the air and keep them from entering your lungs your mouth can't do that okay so that's why it's more healthy to breathe through your nose now i personally breathe through my mouth a lot because i have sinus problems my nose is clogged like 80 percent of the time and apparently now that's a coronavirus symptom so i'm like oh crap i'm gonna have symptoms every day um i try to breathe through both but if i just clog my nose i, I i'm gonna suffocate so but yeah it is better to breathe through your nose for that reason okay so 
the air will travel down the trachea okay not the esophagus this is a complete different tube air is supposed to go down the trachea not food okay the trachea is actually you can feel your trachea it is a really tough tube it's hard it's made of cartilage if you put your hand here and just feel your trachea that hard thing that you're feeling is the trachea okay does anyone know why the trachea is made up of cartilage and is strong but your esophagus is just a normal tube with muscles okay why is your trachea made up of cartilage anyone what would happen if your trachea was not made of cartilage it would be a lot easier to close it would be a lot easier to close thank you your esophagus, the, the thing that connects your stomach to your mouth, that can close. If you're not eating, you don't need that to be open, right? But your trachea needs to be open all the time because you need to breathe all the time. If your trachea is closed, you're suffocating, okay? If you want to, if you see those uh, TV shows where people try to murder someone by choking them to death, they're, they're closing the trachea with force. Because the trachea is supposed to stay open, you have cartilage, you are forcing it to close with your hands. That's how you kill somebody. Okay, and if you watch like movies like Saw, um, somebody's like they have their mouth covered and they're suffocating. And then one of the movies, some dude takes a pen and jabs their trachea, and so that you, the air can still go in directly into the lung without their mouth. Don't try that at home, but the, the, the dude is suffocating, so. In, in a last resort, he resorts to puncturing the trachea so that air can go in. That is a possibility. Okay, so the trachea is made up of cartilage because it needs to stay open. Also, inside the trachea, you have hair. I'm not talking about the hair on your head. I'm talking about cells that look like hair. So they're called cilia. They have a job of keeping things out of your lungs. You don't want things aside from air to go into your lungs okay if you're choking you will start to cough i don't know if, if you choke on saliva and i'm pretty sure everyone experienced that you go like <coughs> 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 why do you do that because um, the hair is trying to sweep out whatever is trying to enter the lungs it's, it's supposed to sweep it, it goes like this it, it sweeps it out upwards and also it produces mucus. Again, it filters the air as it goes as it goes into your lungs even more so that you wanna make sure that dusts are not caught inside of your lungs. Okay, does that make sense? Right, okay, let's move on. So now you're inside the lungs, you, you travel down the trachea, you go through those tiny branches uh, called the bronchus or bronchi for plural. Now you're inside that final destination, that grape looking structure uh, or a, a blackberry, raspberry looking structure called the alveolus. The alveolus is singular. Plural is alveoli. So these are the site of gas exchange. Blood vessels, capillaries will pass through the alveoli. The oxygen will dump the carbon dioxide. The, the blood will dump carbon dioxide and suck oxygen because <gasps> you breathe oxygen into your lungs. In your every alveoli, oxygen goes into your blood. The blood carries that back into the heart and then the heart will pump it all over the body. So these are sites of gas exchange. They're extremely important for your body. And these are, cannot be replaced. If you destroy one, that is a permanent damage, okay? That does not grow back. So you don't want to damage your lungs. Drowning, meaning water inside of your lungs, it can wash away some of the important mucus that is on the alveoli, thereby damaging it. So drowning will damage your lungs. Smoking will damage your lungs because if you smoke, there's chemicals, black tar, 
that will accumulate inside of your lungs. It will literally make your lungs black and it will block the alveoli. Again, that is lung damage, which is why smoking is such a terrible idea. Okay, so first of all, do you have any questions about the alveolus? What does it do? Gas exchange. They cannot be replaced. Okay, they're at the tips of those branches inside of your lungs. We have a ton of these. Okay, breathing. Um, how do you breathe? Like, you you all know how to. Uh, no, smoking does not cause it to rupture. Uh, it, it simply damages it by covering it and. Uh, perhaps reacting uh, with some of the cells there, which eventually causes cancer. It, it does not rupture it. Okay, we all know how to breathe. If you didn't know how to breathe, you didn't make it, okay, past birth. But how do we breathe? Like, your brain knows, but you don't know. Well, I mean, you could know, but I'm not sure. Here's how you breathe. Um, you have muscles here. Uh, can you see that? Here, okay, below your lungs that separate your abdomen, your stomach, with your lungs. You have something called a diaphragm. When the diaphragm contracts, that means they squeeze this, it will go down. The diaphragm, it looks like this, it will go down. Once it does, you have more room in your lungs, your chest expands and then air will go in, okay? You can control your diaphragm. You can you can force it to go down, and then you can let it back up. When it relaxes, contracts, it relaxes, it will push the air out, and your rib cage will then contract, and this squeezes air out of your body. That is exhalation. Oh, whoops, okay? To breathe in, you push down the diaphragm. To breathe out, you relax it to let the air out. Okay, do we have any questions? No? Okay. Um, I said that this is voluntary uh, because you can consciously control your breath. You can just think about how you can... <gasps> I'm doing that on purpose, okay? Or I can... <gasps> I can hold my breath on purpose, you, I have some kind of control over the diaphragm, but I don't have complete control. I cannot choose to stop breathing. Breathing is automatic. If I choose to stop breathing, eventually I will pass out and the brain will breathe for me, okay? You don't have to think to breathe. You're not gonna forget to breathe, okay? That is something that your brain will just do it in the background. You don't have to worry about it. It's on autopilot so you don't you don't accidentally die because you forgot to breathe so it, it is automatic but you can take over and to some extent we're almost finished here um there is a disease that is quite uh, famous for lungs a uh, uh, tuberculosis if you go to the hospital um actually no that, that's not the one i'm thinking of um tuberculosis killed a lot of people in the past um, it is when bacteria in, invade your lungs, and this will affect your ability to breathe. And when you have a bacterial infection, you usually uh, develop a fever, and it's in your lungs, so you start coughing, uh, weight loss, tiredness, and chest pain, the whole nine yards. Okay, this can be lethal if you don't treat it. Thankfully, we can treat it. Okay, bacteria can be killed using antibiotics. You can just take some antibiotics over the course of a few weeks. You kill all of them. You get better. No problem. So today, tuberculosis is not that big of a deal uh, as it is in the past because now we can treat bacterial infection. But again, if you don't treat it, this can be lethal. So lung problems are serious. If you have a history of lung illness, uh, you have to be careful. Um, like I almost died when I was a kid because of my lungs. I have serious lung problems. Uh, but now that I'm older, um, I think I got over them. But still, um, when I develop a cough, I will cough for like two months. Um, and it happens every year. Every year I get sick. I cough for like 
three months straight. I'm actually not sick. It's just my lungs are messed up. They just keep coughing. I don't actually have any bacteria anymore. They're just inflamed. So if you have lung issues, uh, you should treat it better. Uh, be very careful. Oh, sorry. Any questions before we end it? No? Okay. So to sum up what we've learned today, okay? We learned the digestive system. You need to know the organs of the digestive system. Food goes in through mouth. What does the mouth do? Well, it chews it and mix it with saliva. And then it goes down the esophagus, which pushes it down automatically. It goes to the stomach. The stomach releases acid and enzymes to digest and break down into the small intestines where nutrients are absorbed, into the large intestines where water is absorbed, and then you poop it out through the anus. That's the waste. Okay, that's from food to poop, that's what happens. Um, also, uh, you have accessory organs of um, the liver, pancreas, gallbladder, they all help with digestion. Okay, the circulatory system, the heart, well, you have a heart. Arteries and veins, arteries are vessels that pump blood away from the heart. Veins pump blood back into the heart. Okay, what does it do? Well, it carries oxygen, it carries nutrients, and it carries waste. So it's extremely important that your heart is functioning all the time. Um, also, you have coronary heart disease. If your blood vessels are blocked in the heart, it can lead to a heart attack. And if you have a heart attack, call 911 immediately. And if you have continued problems with your heart, your coronary artery, you can get surgery. Again, that's risky, but... Well, you probably need it. And then finally, the respiratory system, the lungs, you have the mouth or the nose goes down the trachea, not the esophagus, into the bronchi, and then eventually into the alveoli. Those are the grape uh, structures all over your lungs, and that is where the blood vessels come and exchange carbon dioxide for oxygen. Okay, and how do you breathe? You have the diaphragm when you contract it, <gasps> You take a breath. When you relax it, you breathe it out. Okay? And that's it. I'm going to stop this one.